21 minutes it's written no no why the meeting is being live streamed no no but live stream is like uh, because everyone has to go cannot go late uh, chat disabled how to kind of talk to him cannot chat also cannot write am i audible uh, yeah yes, now yes. audible hey, you are saying 21 minutes hello hi yeah you are audible can you hear us yes sir yes sir yeah uh, what is your name your name sir dharmendra okay dharmendra uh, mm-hmm. now uh, my all my speakers are here and uh, when do we go live dharmendra again you muted yourself ha huh. yeah sir so uh, when you want to start then we, we can go live no no we are ready can we start okay sir i'm making a type just oh, no no just two minutes just uh, give us two minutes sure. yeah after two minutes you can start like okay uh, just uh, wanted... armender ji ek countdown de dijiyega to hame pata chal jayega ki kab live aap start kar rahe suna dharmender ji kya bola gaya yes sir yes okay to hamare ko just ek minute ka time do hum log baat karke fir chalu kar sakte hain within 1 minute kya so uh, thanks uh, mr paveso andre uh, padma and uh, manisha for joining and uh, what we'll do is there is nothing like uh, as a chairperson moderator nothing uh, we will just get started uh, so the sequence will be uh, mr paveso will go first he has some other commitment is already said and he will start with this clarities so uh, if you can keep it for 12 to 13 minutes and then uh, we can ask a couple of questions uh, within the panel itself we'll ask one or two questions uh, short uh, answers you can give and then by 15 minutes we hope that you are done with your q and a as well as your presentation after that i can make a short presentation and uh, uh, can ask me i might have to go as well because i need to go somewhere and though i was supposed to be there for entire 2 hours uh, but uh, then uh, the sequence will be after that is uh, what are the sequence uh, manisha in that uh, we go ahead with uh, andre andre yeah and andre, then padma yeah. and i i and- probably would be the last and then there is dr somsila also they have added in the latest one yeah okay. uh, that one was added by uh, dr namrata so we'll have uh, total six talks okay dharmendra ji uh, we are good to go live okay sir just take one second and tell us whenever we are live आपके कोई ऑडियंस क्वेश्चन आएंगे कहीं पर धर्मेंद्र जी या द क्वेश्चन विल बी आस्क फ्रॉम द फ्रंट एंड साइड सो हाउ हाउ विल हाउ विल बी नो वेयर द क्वेश्चंस आर कमिंग वेयर वी कैन सी देयर इज अ बैक एंड प्लेटफॉर्म सो सो वेयर वी कैन आई कैन सेंड यू द क्वेश्चन ऑन द जूम चैट ओके बेस्ड ऑन चलो ठीक है तो जस्ट कीप सेंडिंग देयर ओके चालू कर लो Hi, Dr. Andre. Hi. How are you? Yeah. Nice to have you in a meeting. Dharmendra ji, we are good. धर्मेंद्र जी आप सुन पा रहे हैं या या मैम ठीक है शुरू करें धर्मेंद्र जी यस सर वी कैन स्टार्ट वी आर लाइव ओके हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ इंटरनेशनल यूएटी स्टडी ग्रुप 
and uh, we'd like to welcome each one of you for taking time out to listen uh, to some of the eminent speakers from India and outside India, from all over the world. So we have a galaxy of speakers today with us who will share their experience related to the field of inflammation, or you call it as a uveitis. And uh, we will be having different speakers from UK, Brazil, India. So to start with is Professor Carlos Povicio from Moorfields Eye Hospital in University College London. He'll be sharing with us uh, his uh, experience and his pearls of wisdom related to scleritis. After that, I'll be giving a talk on the pearls related to intraocular inflammation in the eye and then some of the mistakes in the uveitis. Then we'll have uh, Dr. Andre Curie who will be talking to us on the toxoplasmosis, once again, seen commonly. Then Dr. Padma Malini to share her uh, things on uh, the infectious uveitis. And very important talk will be by Dr. Manisha Agrawal from Shroff Charity about how to use this steroid smartly. So these are the topics which we are going to cover. And then we'll have Dr. Somsila as well from All India Ophthalmic Society to present her talk on the UVITIS. So to start with, let me welcome uh, Professor Carlos Provisio, who does not need any introduction in the field of UVITIS. Professor Carlos Provisio, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rupesh, and, and thank you for the invitation to speak. It's a pleasure to join the group and uh, share the experience in this topic of uh, scleritis. Um, just see if I can get share my slides. Okay, so scleritis, I'll, I'll just give you a very broad overview of uh, aspects related to the clinical uh, manifestations, uh, some of the importance in diagnosing uh, potential associations and, and management issues. I think the important thing to remember is that scleritis can be caused by a variable group of diseases. So it's, it's not just one specific problem, but it can be quite quite variable and the inflammatory response is centered in the sclera, but the tissues which are adjacent can be affected too. So it's not uncommon for you to see involvement of the cornea or involvement of the trabeculum, so patients developing problems with pressure or intraocular involvement involving the posterior segment. So this is something that can happen in, in very um, aggressive forms. And also have to remember that sometimes the inflammation of the sclera can be caused by a primary intraocular inflammation, which is then reaching the sclera. And, and you'll hear about toxoplasmosis later on. It's one of the potential causes of scleritis, as, as, as well as herpes viruses, as a retinitis causing scleritis. Um, even though it's uncommon, it is a potentially blinding condition. And there is a very potential association with systemic disorders, which can kill the patient in, in a short time, if not recognized. So this is a classification which was proposed many years ago, uh, originally by uh, Watson and Heyre, and then has been recently modified. I think Professor Rao has been involved in that process, but it shows very clearly that you separate, especially focusing on the scleritis into anterior and posterior disease, and all of them potentially in diffuse nodular and necrotizing. Um, when we look at the necrotizing anterior scleritis, we, we have different manifestations. In the past, we would say necrotizing scleritis with inflammation and without inflammation, which would be scleromalacia perforans, and the other forms would be the inflammatory forms. So you have vaso-occlusive, the granulomatous form, and the scenes which is surgically induced scleritis. Just to give you here this, this uh, very uh, schematic uh, illustration, uh, of what it looks like. Remember, the scler itself is not vascularized. Uh, it is uh, supplied uh, you know, by choroid internally and episcleral plexus externally, and the episcleral plexus can be superficial and, and deep. So when you have an episcleritis, it is a superficial episcleral plexus which is involved, so the scler itself is not involved. And you can see in your examination that the redness is on the superficial vessels. You don't get the deep hue that you, you see in, in true scleritis, which is involving the profound deep episcleral uh, plexus and, and that will generate a redness which you can see is deeper. Ways of separating this, you, you, you always heard about the issue of the uh, phenylephrine 10% test, which is something we haven't been using these days very much because of the risk of, of cardiac events in some of our older patients. Uh, but if you examine the patient with a with a green light, you can tell you know, where the, the, the redness is coming from or put the patient on natural light. So it's easier to also tell the difference. The anterior diffuse and nodular are put together because they, even though they clinically look different, many of the other aspects are similar. There are less aggressive forms. They occur in individuals about the same age group, 40 to 60. 
they're less associated uh, with ocular complications and still have an association with systemic disease of about 40% of the cases. So just to show here what, what happens with the inflammation of the deep epithelial plexus, so the sclera itself gets swollen. And as I said before, that swelling can eventually pro inflammation progress into the eye involving the choroid and potentially leading to complications, which I'll show you in a bit later on. This is a case of a diffuse um, scleritis, anterior scleritis. You can see some corneal involvement here in this as if, uh, slide at the top. And the reason for these images below is to show that if you do an angiogram and you can use ICG is better than fluorescein because it doesn't leak profusely, you can identify if there are areas of occlusion. And if you see occlusion, it's an indication that this is progressing towards a necrotizing form. These are examples here of nodular. Usually the nodules are a few millimeters behind the limbus. They could be one or more, but and usually they recur in the same area. That's a very typical thing to see. Uh, and if you have several recurrences, very commonly the area affected, you can see a change in the color of the um, sclera because the collagen changes configuration and allows you to see through to uh, uveal tissue. The necrotizing form is, is much more serious, not only because it's destructive to the globe itself and can result in visual loss more than the other forms, but also has a, a high association with systemic disease with 29% of the patients potentially dying within five years of the diagnosis. So you can see there's a, a high risk of ocular complications, visual loss, and potentially more serious uh, life-threatening problems. Uh, the patients here tend to be older, it's also most of the times a bilateral condition, but it can be unilateral. The pain is out of proportion to what you see in the examination. So the patients really uh, recur, uh, present to you with unbearable pain. Uh, and there is a very strong association of this form with a systemic disease. So you see about 90% of the cases. So this is a peripheral ulcerative keratitis, which I just put in here to remind you, if you see this, this is already an indication of a systemic vasculitis. So this is a situation when you have to look for an underlying vasculitic disorder because this is causing ischemia in that area, causing this gutter in the periphery. These are examples here of necrotizing disease. And you can see it's very easy when you see these whitish areas of a, a melting of the sclera, which then also involves the conjunctiva. So these areas become uh, not covered by cons. Uh, and of course, they, as they resolve, they leave extensive areas of uh, change in transparency. But if you lose tissue, you can also progress to staphylomas. So what you see here is a demonstration of the use of the technique of an angiogram to identify vessels which uh, are closed and, and are the, the reason why the patients are developing this phenomenon. This is another example here, which is another case of uh, uh, ICG and geography in a, one of my patients in clinic, just to show the extensive areas of non-perfusion that they experience during the acute event. So this is to show you the progression, how quickly it can be. This is in March, this is a long time ago, uh, and it shows very quickly how this went from uh, just involving the limbal area to destroying pretty much all the sclera uh, superiorly to the cornea. Once they resolve, they will leave, as I mentioned before, either areas of transparency or real thinning, and then bulging, which is the staphyloma, even with normal intraocular pressure. So these are great examples of how this can develop and, and result in, in structural damage to the sclera, and consequently, um, significant changes to the corneal uh, curvature. So these patients very often have very deep uh, uh, astigmatism. Uh, just, just an example here of this uh, kind of just a little buttonhole type of uh, uh, picture with uveal tissue prolapsing through that uh, scleral hole and, and just covered by conjunctiva. Surgically induced is the form that uh, is associated with a, an existing procedure in the past, and that can be from weeks to years after the procedure. Uh, we see that frequently in patients who have surgery like the region surgery, enhanced uh, the effect of mitomycin, uh, patients who had uh, screen surgery or the old extracapsular procedure when the incision was uh, scleral. And the inflammation really can vary could be since the beginning, but it can really take several years to develop. And there is a strong association with a systemic disease in 50 to 90% of the cases. 
So the reason for that is likely that the, the original procedure induced some vascular changes locally and, and there's abnormal vessels in the future when the patient is older and develops a autoimmune disease uh, and, and we have circulating antibodies, these circulating antibodies will preferentially deposit in these abnormal vessels and then trigger the initial response which you generate the scleritis. That's the reason for the gap, which can be so many years after the fact. So these are some examples uh, of cases which are post vitrectomy. So it's not common to see that, but we, we have a series of patients who presented with uh, necrotizing scleritis following vitrectomy. It's really important in all cases of necrotizing scleritis to be absolutely sure, sure that there is not an infection going on. So you have to take a sample because it could be a bacterial infection, which then of course will result in melting as well. So clinically it may be confused, but if you take a sample, you guarantee that you're excluding that since the management is gonna be very different. So these are some examples here. You can see very well uh, plaques. In this case, being multifocal, uh, it, it makes you think more of an immunological process than an infective process. And these patients here uh, resolved only when uh, they were treated with infliximab. This is a long time ago. This when infliximab was just beginning to come out and we were lucky to be able to use, but they were res not responding very well to conventional therapy. This is another example here. Scleromalacia perforans is what used to be called the necrotizing scleritis without inflammation. So this is an older patient, very frequently females. It's a, one of the real predominance of females. These are usually people who have suffered very badly with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and, and the rheumatoid arthritis is really serious. You see, look at their hands, and there's many times stuck on a wheelchair because of the disease, and they present to this. How they present? Well, this is not a picture of walking with pain. Many times they come in to be seen because someone told them their eyes look different or the vision may be changing because of astigmatism and, and it's not because of pain. And they're usually not a very red eye, it might be very minimal uh, changes to the surface. But you, you see it in the eyes, you can tell, I'll show you an example, how different it looks because of the damage to the sclera. But what they find is some, you will find some, some yellow plaques. Those plaques are areas of sequestration. So the reason for the difference between the the one with inflammation or inflammation is where the occlusion is occurring. In this form here, we believe it's an arteriolar occlusion. So there's an infarct leaving the sequestration, which then gets absorbed and leaves you with the area of staphyloma. In the other forms I showed you before, we believe it's a venular occlusion. So it, it's very much like having the similar situation of a, a vein occlusion in the retina, hemorrhages and, and more severe involvement of the tissues around. So the venular event in the sclera would be a similar situation of a, a much more severe presentation. So here an example, you can see this patient really is not complaining of pain, did never complain of pain. You can see areas of sequestration here, so areas which are still progressing, but look at the size of this staphyloma and the large areas involved. You can imagine this must have been a very painful thing, and actually this not wasn't a painful thing. This patient, I always make a, a bit of a joke here because this patient was referred to me for cataract surgery by someone that until then I considered a friend. Uh, but you can see very well, uh, that the difficulty in operating this patient is exactly the approach. You now we have to choose very carefully how you're going to tackle this cataract. And, and clearly, uh, luckily now with FACO, it's, it's much more possible. Imagine doing this with a with a gastro Kessler as we used to do in the past. These are other uh, very extreme examples of scleromalacia perforans, so painless uh, presentation with extensive destruction of the sclera. Shifting from the anterior to the posterior scleritis, which is important in the message here for you, is that a posterior scleritis is a serious problem. It's underdiagnosed. It is occurring in a part of the back of the eye where you can involve the optic nerve, the macula, so it is potentially a blinding condition. And it lacks many times signs that will make the diagnosis possible. So it relies a lot of the times in investigations, imaging to help us make the diagnosis. So there is an association, the age of the patient is variable. We have had patients who are very young, as young as, young as five, uh, and we have had older patients as well. In young people, the likelihood of, of having any association with a systemic problem, extremely low. Uh, but in older age group, you can find about 30% of the cases having an association with a systemic disease. So these are some of the issues that will make your diagnosis easier in terms of thinking about it because these are common manifestations of complications associated with a posterior scleritis. So this is schematically showing the serious detachment that makes 
for serious scleritis, a differential diagnosis with VKH. Again, here you can see a mass in the choroid, so it's reflecting uh, the presence of this lesion, sterile lesion right behind that area. The folds here that you can see, the retinal folds, and you can see here in the angiogram uh, the involvement of the choroid and the retinal pigment epithelium. This is something you can see again, a mass, a subretinal mass, and many times the subretinal mass may not disappear completely, even after the, the patient is treated and the inflammation is resolved, you may remain with this uh, subretinal abnormality. These are typical choroidal folds going horizontally across the posterior pole and typically representing a reduction of the arc of, of, of curvature of the sclera induced by the inflammation and the swelling of the sclera. Again, another case with the retinal folds and involvement of the optic nerve, you can see the swelling of the nerve, the retinal folds and fluid, of course, associated with this posterior scleritis. The B-scan represents your best friend in terms of diagnosing this. So you can see the thickening. When you measure the thickness of the back, you don't measure the thickness of the sclera independent of the choroid. You're usually measuring the thickness of the posterior coats of the eye. Normally is about two millimeters or around that. And, and you can see a thickening. And if you see thickening of the posterior coat with fluid generating this, this dark line, especially if you have the T sign, which is gonna be the typical manifestation of a uh, posterior scleritis. Some of the patients will show more of a nodular appearance, as you can see here, some others are gonna be more diffuse. I don't think I have, actually, even though the classification talks about necrotizing posterior scleritis, uh, I don't think I have seen a case. I think the, the, the vascularization of the back is, is more protective from a total necrotizing event. This is an example here, which I showed you before, which can be easily confused with VKH, the presence of these multiple areas of leakage from the RPE and the accumulation of subretinal fluid associated with the posterior scleritis. So I mentioned before, it's not to be forgotten that infectious scleritis has to be considered in patients with a necrotizing disease. So they'll take a sample to make sure. It's more commonly seen in patients who have a trauma or a surgical intervention, so buckles for a long time, and of course, uh, fungi would be in case of uh, trauma, vegetable matter mostly, uh, viruses, the herpes viruses, uh, especially can cause direct involvement or coming secondarily from a retinitis and parasites. I mentioned uh, toxoplasmosis before. And remember, a pentamoeba uh, was a problem many, many years ago when we had this epidemic of contact lens related acantamoeba infections of the cornea, but also scleral involvement with seriously painful eyes with scleritis. So the examples here, this is a patient actually uh, with leprosy. You can see the nodules here and this developing a diffuse nodular um, scleritis would be more typical of TB, for instance, or leprosy, but some patients can present with more diffuse disease. These are examples here of patients who underwent retinal surgery and develop more uh, like a pseudomonas case. This is a staphylococcus case. So these are cases that you have to be careful. Uh, and this you can see here very easily, patients who present primarily with a corneal infection can eventually develop invasion extension into the sclera. How do you treat this patient? So, of course, if it's infectious, you're going to deal more with specific treatment for that infection. You may have to debride the area of infection to clear penetration of the drug. Access by the drug to the sclera is not easy, so you have to facilitate and, and topical therapy is important and systemic therapy will be added as well. If we leave aside the infectious diseases, just mentioning here, non-steroidals are very helpful, but not in necrotizing disease. Uh, topical therapy is not helpful in changing the course of disease, but may help with the symptoms. And of course, the use of steroids orally or intravenously in very severe patient cases will uh, be the best way of bringing it under control. In some patients, of course, the disease responds well initially to the steroid, but then, of course, we will not respond well when the steroids are reduced, and they will have to introduce a second line agent to maintain control, and then we escalate if necessary uh, to biologics and surgery as a last resort, and I'll show you a little bit why. So the second line agents, are, all of these agents have been used. I think methotrexate especially has a good effect, uh, and but you can try cyclosporin, not a very good option, just like a, an, an alternative in case you, the others are failing. But these days with the use of biologics, the, uh, the need for cyclosporin becomes uh, less. Cyclophosphamide, extremely effective in, in the patients who have ANCA positive scleritis. So granulomatosis with polygitis, these patients, the GPAs tend to do well with cyclophosphamide, 
uh, and biologics, of course, can be also um, used. In Fliximab, I won't spend a lot of time here, but just mentioning for you the efficacy of this alternative also being explored, and we have seen response in many patients. This is a study from Jim Rosenbaum's group in Portland, Oregon, showing the use of rituximab in patients who had failed to respond uh, to uh, other alternatives, refractory cases of non-infectious scleritis, and showing that it did achieve response in some patients regarding uh, requiring uh, further infusions uh, after uh, some time. So this is the rituximab uh, work showing the benefit of this strategy. Both well, sclerosis is just a message here. All, all patients have to be treated aggressively because of the risk of visual loss. So we never know, we cannot tell in advance who may lose vision or not. Surgical intervention is left really for situations uh, when you have uh, the risk, when you have a perforation or you want to remove a, a process which, you know, an infectious process is leading to a destructive uh, situation, but do not plan this for just a staphyloma. A staphyloma should be left alone. A staphyloma will very rarely per perforate. These are older patients who are not playing rugby, they do not doing anything very aggressive, and they're not going to have blows to their eyes very often. So if, if you see a quiet eye with a staphyloma, do not propose to intervene just to patch the staphyloma if the eye is not a threat of immediate visual loss. I think it's left for situations of more aggressive cases when you can see the extent of surgery that may be required to replace uh, the damaged tissue. So I think uh, mentioning finally here one thing I didn't put before, but the local therapy has been advocated and used by some colleagues. We are always worried about local therapy injections because of uh, the risk of necrosis. So avoid necrotizing disease. But this has been done by Narsi Rao and uh, our friends from Australia as well, showing that a subconjunctival tramcin alone can be very effective in controlling patients, especially those patients who have uh, problems related to using of systemic therapy. So these are some of the cases in which it's been used. And it shows here that it can be effective, it can be repeated. It is really not associated with serious complications. Uh, but of course, you have to be careful with infection and necrotizing disease. In conclusion, necrotizing scleritis is the one you have to worry about uh, with visual loss and associated systemic disease. Posterior scleritis don't underestimate the risk of visual loss and treat it aggressively. And these are the two reasons for visual loss, mainly necrotizing and posterior. Anterior uveitis, just to mention here, is not uh, um, uh, diseases that cause anterior uveitis or uveitis and scleritis are not the same. But if you have a severe scleritis or even an scleritis, you may develop some anterior uveitis associated with that. Topical therapy may have symptoms, but will not resolve the disease process. And subconjunctival steroids, as I showed you now, is an option, but avoiding necrotizing disease. Remember that systemic therapy in patients with necrotizing disease is the way to preserve vision and potentially treat the seriousness of this underlying disease. Non-steroidals are limited to non-necrotizing disease and should not be used for more serious cases. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Mr. Poviso. Always uh, uh, definitely a very, very impressive talk and uh, really speak about so many of the cases and it's very challenging. Just in interest of time, I think we'll move forward. Uh, I'm sure there are more number of queries which people will ask, but uh, we have uh, quite a number of things to cover. So we'd like to thank you on behalf of the IOS and IUSG for spending uh, your time and uh, enlightening us uh, with the pearls related to scleritis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rupesh. Thank, thank you all. And I'll see you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'll I'll give a short presentation on i usually keep two presentation and i think uh, let me go to my shorter presentation so this is uh, the topic which i wanted to kind of uh, cover in detail but i think uh, today i'll just give a very brief overview of uh, my approach to a patient with uveitis and this is more applicable to general ophthalmologists not particularly to the uveitis specialist and i thought uh, the audience would be more of general ophthalmologists so we we get uh, lots of uh, patients of uveitis in our clinic and what is the best way to approach uh, some of these patients so usually there is a quite quite a number of things which are going on you're starting with the complaints you're going with the history then demographics uh, history again if you see the history can be going on again and again and then you have the treatment history, then you miscellaneous, then uh, you try to kind of identify some names and you go for examination and then investigation. Quite a lot of things which are happening in the circle. And I try to kind of make it a bit simpler by saying that uh, you assessing the clinical features after the symptoms.
in terms of the signs, then allowing you to assess the severity of the uveitis, and then allowing you to say whether it is a healed or active, infective, non-infective, and then only coming at a morphologic diagnosis. So some of those things uh, probably if you can follow, it will really, really help you. And once again, when you go for the classification, there are different types of classification, which uh, people have spoken about a uh, lot of new things are coming up, but something which should be very simple, anatomical and all those classification. So with that, I'd like to move to my second slide deck, which is uh, not so detailed. And I just wanted to kind of uh, share on those uh, samples, which will directly kind of uh, show. One second, I'll just change it. Uh, okay, so this is the pearls, which I usually keep it as a short presentation. And uh, this is not backed up by the cases, but believe me, every single pearls is backed up by many, many cases, uh, which all of us uh, see. And let me just go into the Zoom thing of that. Yeah. So this is uh, a simple six slides where I wanted to share 15 pearls across this. A, I just spoke about this. We start with the morphologic diagnosis, the pearl number one. Then we try to give some kind of a nomenclature. Accordingly, we ordered some investigation based on our own learning based on the, each case to case, and then particularly come to the infective etiology. Uh, do consider masquerade as and when you are dealing with these pearls are not in any particular chronological order. And but this is just uh, we as we walk across the cases of you get is those are the things which you have to keep in mind. Pearl number three is a dilated fundus examination is essential in any patient with the disc swelling or for that matter, any patient of uveitis. And this is again backed up on a lot of cases which were published in literature as well. And one of the cases was optic neuritis where a peripheral acute retinal necrosis was missed because the doctor never dilated the fundus to check the peripheral retina. So very important in any patient of uveitis, you should try and see a good uh, fundus examination, do a good fundus examination. Fourth, uh, again, uh, there is a good topic by Dr. Padma, which where she will highlight about the infective causes. And therefore, it is very important to, to keep the infective diagnosis because in those cases, it might be difficult to pull back our diagnosis and go back uh, to kind of uh, the treatment if we kind of commit too early of giving biologics or corticosteroids or immunosuppressive therapy. Regular monitoring and close follow-up is quite critical in some of these patients. You can't just say them, you come back in one or two years. A lot of these patients, you have to kind of uh, tell them beforehand itself as you start the treatment that they might need to be regularly seen uh, and very closely follow up with you. So I typically tell them that this is a long uh, courtship which is going to develop and a friendship which is going to develop with the patients. And any patient coming to my clinic, usually I tell them that this is not just a kind of a one uh, instance or one encounter. You might have come multiple times. Then the pearl number six is appropriate interventions is right time. And this is again based on the learning where we never did uh, laser retinopexy in a patient of acute retinal necrosis and uh, the patient ended up getting a detachment of the retina. And there are many, many cases like that, which uh, allowed us to come to this particular pearl. Then think outside the box uh, while we approach a patient of a uveitis, always keep uh, your eccentric uh, ideas or different things in your mind. And you might be dealing with something very recently I just wanted to share this experience of me managing a patient of retinal vasculitis who have been seen with us for last 10 years from 2009, treated with tubercular retinal vasculitis. And recently, my another hospital called me and said, uh, Dr. Rupesh, uh, we wanted to talk to you about your patient. I said, what happened to my patient? He said, the patient is admitted with us with chronic myeloid leukemia. Now, I have been seeing his photo and which I wanted to show it today is was that I was dealing with chronic myeloid leukemia. Did I miss that diagnosis mm -hmm. or uh, the patient was stable for last two, three years and I never did a full blood count because everything was stable. But, you know, some of those things where that bothers you, is that something systemic which is happening and are we missing anything? So therefore, keep thinking outside the box in some of this patient where you get some unusual finding. To check all the investigations you have ordered, sometimes we order the investigation and then we forget to check. It is very, very important to check all those investigations which we have ordered. I have missed one of the investigations was syphilis and we were treating the patient for HIV. In between the syphilis was ordered and we were giving him CMV retinitis therapy. And in between suddenly developed acute placoid uh, retinitis, uh, which was suggestive of syphilis. And then we went back to the investigation and we saw the syphilis was positive two months before. Probably if we would have treated and that this patient would not have developed the macular lesion. To check the medication which the patient is taking and check the compliance of the patient, because a lot of times our patients uh, come with all the story and we don't know whether the patient is taking the right medication and if they are taking it properly or not. 
so to counsel the patients about the disease and medications and i particularly take time out of my clinic spend maybe one lunch with them kind of thing that uh, my lunch or my evening late evening talking to them in detail spending time with them as much time as you spend they will be more comfortable they will be more receptive and something area which i am of late working quite uh, closely with them psychological counseling of those patients spending time with them which probably will help them uh, during their treatment be confident uh, confident before administering invasive therapy and we talk about the intravital ozone in, in today's world we have to be super confident that we are not dealing with something uh, disaster in the eye before you inject because that is a commitment and before giving a commitment like invasive therapy just make sure that you're confident because we have a patient who received intravital gamsaclovir when i was attending iois meeting in san francisco and that patient never had cmv retinitis was having cotton wool spot but after the injection the patient developed no light perception now why did it develop no one knows but really it happens and Mr. Paviso will agree with me about the second opinion. I don't think any Tuesday clinic of his at Moorfields has ever finished before we kind of uh, collect together all the fellows and he and 8 p.m., 8.30 p.m. when we are all hungry, we are talking about three or four cases where we don't have any head and clue and we are talking about what's happening. Right, Mr. Paviso, some of those cases which we all remember from your busy clinics in London. Yeah. So, and then important to pay subtle attention to subtle clues and probably it will take uh, the wisdom of uh, Andre Curie and uh, Carlos Pavisio and uh, the skill sets of uh, Padma and Manisha to get to this, uh, picking up the subtle clues to get to the diagnosis. Look at the patient and not the labs. Yesterday, I got a patient who was shouting at me, you're not telling me about my labs. Uh, I said, let me examine the eyes. No, no, I want to know the do uh, investigations. You took $600 from me. What happened to that? I said, I will come to that. But the patient was saying, no, no, just tell me about my investigations. So these are the era we are living in, but I think uh, I kind of fully counsel the patient that I want to examine you, not your labs. Afterwards, I will examine, but first I want to examine you. And uh, last but not the least, as I've already covered, keep a high index of suspicion for any infectious etiology. So with that, I like to share, stop my uh, sharing of this 15 different pearls. Uh, it's quite a lot, uh, which has come uh, over a different many years and i'm happy to learn i'm learning more and i'm happy to learn from my colleagues and my friends and all who can continue to add to this uh, some of this pulse thank you very much Manisha. thank you rupesh i think that was a very crisp presentation and putting together your vast experience of managing patients of uveitis and though they were all single lines but i think they conveyed a very important message in each line I'm Thank sure it, it must be very interesting for people to gather all that information. Moving on to the next presentation, we'll have uh, Dr. Andre, and he'll be speaking to us on toxoplasmosis. Thanks, so Manisha. I'll have to take a move, but uh, sorry, I think you continue, and I'll probably join again at some other sure. seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rupesh, Thank you. for joining. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for a kind invitation, Manisha Hupesh, and I will try to cover uh, about toxoplasmosis. It's a quite difficult uh, um, issue. It's important to remember the cycle of the parasite, but more important than this is to consider that toxoplasmosis can be a different disease. So you can divide into congenital toxoplasmosis, uh, systemic disease, when you have the acute disease, so we have fever, skin rash, lymphadenopathy. The systemic disease in pregnant women, so you have the risk to congenital toxoplasmosis. Uh, also, ocular toxoplasmosis, immunocompetent individual, so the treatment will be different, the diagnosis will be different. Um, the ocular toxoplasmosis in pregnant women, so this is another issue you have to address, the treatment will be different from uh, immunocompetent individuals, the toxoplasmosis in immunosuppressed individual and the neurotoxoplasmosis. So you can split the, 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 the toxoplasmosis in different uh, uh, diseases. So here is the, the clinical manifestation of congenital toxoplasmosis with the uh, Sabine triad with hydrocephalus, calcification and retinal choroiditis. This is a typical uh, lesion in the macular area. And it's really a disaster to see uh, this kind of involvement in the central nervous system and in the macula of both eyes. Uh, this is the siblings with uh, congenital toxo. 
And what's important to avoid the congenital toxoplasmosis is to detect the acute infection in pregnant women. Uh, so you have the prophylactic measure and regular, regular serology tests. So in France, you, you do this monthly, in Austria, quarterly, and in Brazil, uh, uh, unfortunately have no obligation to do such uh, uh, regular serology tests. So uh, it's important to know that transmission risk of congenital tox is approximately 30%. So how, um, how far the pregnancy is going, so it's, it's the highest uh, risk to get the toxo, but the less risk to have a, a, a devastating uh, infection. So it's important to see that uh, people that's never infected by tox, there's no risk to have congenital toxin. If you have a chronic infection, so you have a lesion in the eye, a scar in the eye, there's no risk to transmit to the fetus. But if you have acute infection during pregnancy or three months before, you have the risk to transmit congenital toxoplasmosis. So the diagnosis of congenital toxin in the fetus is, is based on the PCR, in the amniotic flu fluid, or after uh, uh, the born, you can do the IgG, or you can follow this IgG gym, GG for uh, a year. I will show here a study um, led by Dr. Vasconcelos in Minas Gerais in Brazil, it's a state that have 21 million people and they try to screen all newborn uh, for uh, congenital toxo and did IgM in dry blood one sample. So they screen 146,000 uh, newborn and have 190 uh, positive uh, kids. And they saw in the ophthalmic and pediatric clinic uh, 178. and they found nine patients with a previous suspicion, 39 with calcification, 10 with microcephalus, and 12 with hydrocephalus. What is important in this study is that uh, they found almost 8% with retinochoroiditis, much more than previous studies published in the literature, and almost 6 free with bilateral disease and 111 with macular uh, disease. And 47 with active retinochoroiditis. So you need to treat this patient because of the eye, but not only because of the congenital disease. So here is how to uh, treat the patient with um, congenital toxo. I'm not uh, keeping this uh, slide, but it's important to say that all kids with congenital tox has to be treated for one year with a specific treatment to avoid um, neuro uh, commitment and um, ocular involvement. And talking about ocular toxoplasmosis is quite common in, in Brazil. We have a, a survey from 2010 to 2015. We saw 2,972 patients in the National Institute of Infectious Disease and almost 75% uh, were toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis. If you can compare with Australia and Saudi Arabia, we have, you see much more cases of uh, toxo than these other countries. So what's challenges in toxoplasmosis is that all patients ask you the same questions. How did I get this parasite? And this is quite difficult because we know how to get the parasite but now don't know how this particular individual get this parasite. So it's very easy when you have um, um, outbreak in a certain region in the country. So you can study this region and get the, the risk factor. For example, in Erechim, as in the Southeast of Brazil, you have uh, the, um, they eat a lot of raw meat. So it's quite common to have this in, Brazil, in, in Rio de Janeiro is more common to have um, unfiltered water. So it's very, very difficult to see how one special person get the parasite. Uh, will it affect the other eye? 
it's quite common to, to, to have this question. Uh, if you think of the transmission of the toxin and how they spread uh, through the body, it's, it's, you should expect it to have uh, uh, the toxoplasm in both eyes. But what we see normally, it's to affect only one eye. We need to relapse, it's quite common to relapse. And that's why we discuss later on, on prophylaxis. And what should I do to avoid relapses? Really, we don't know yet why uh, it relapses. And what we're trying to do now is to do the prophylaxis uh, to avoid relapses. So this was a survey we did in Campos de Ruetacas in Rio de Janeiro, just to show in this uh, population, uh, the IgG titers is around 90% in poor people. And just in the early, uh, you can see here in this graph, as almost 80% in the IgG. And when they got older, uh, would be around 65% the IgG positive. So in, in Brazil, it's, it's not very uh, important to have a positive IgG because the majority of the population uh, is positive. So the risk factor for toxoplasma glands in this area is not on the cooked beef, but drinking under filtered water at home. So this is another uh, place in Brazil have an outbreak in the 90s showing the water reservoir for a part of the, the city. And there are a lot of cats uh, playing this area and the half of the, the city was infected by toxoplasmosis. Uh, the diagnosis basically is a clinical diagnosis. The serology can help us more to exclude the diagnosis rather than confirm. If you have a positive IgG, just say that this patient had contact with the toxoplasma, but not the, the disease is, is a, a, a toxoplasma retinochoroiditis. Diagnostic vitrectomy, we leave only for very difficult cases. And it's important to pay attention to the elderly, elderly, HIV positive and immunosuppressed patients that the clinical presentation can be a li li little bit different. Um, one single foci of retinochoroiditis, you can think of a primary ocular toxoplasmosis. This is not common. You see around 10% of the patients with IgM positive uh, following uh, fever, rash, and lymphadenopathy. And usually after treatment, you, have, you can see there's almost no scar where the area of um, the healed lesion. This is the classical uh, uh, toxoplasmosis retinochoroiditis. It's always important to see this uh, uh, hyperpigmented scar to confirm the diagnosis. Usually in Brazil, if you see one case like this, we even don't ask for serology and go straight forward for the treatment. You can see here other um, examples of classic active recurrent retinochoroiditis. The presentation is quite different, but you always see this hyperpigmented lesion and uh, area of active necrotizing uh, uh, retinitis. You can see this atypical presentations in, as I mentioned before, in the elderly, HIV positive and immunosuppressed uh, patients. You can have to make the diag differential diagnosis of acute retinal necrosis, viral retinitis. So it's important to keep in mind this large areas of retinitis and also um, bilateral disease. Once again, this large area of retinochoroiditis. You don't see much of these cases in, in um, adults, immunocompetent uh, patients. You can see near retinitis uh, also. And to make the diagnosis, as I mentioned to you, the most important is the clinical picture. But you can use also the goodman whitmer coefficient and poly polymer, uh, the PCR. Uh, it's important that uh, the PCR in toxoplasmosis is not very good. The sensitivity and specificity is not, uh, the sensitivity is not very good. It's very good for uh, viral, but it's not good for um, 
talks to in the AC. So if you get it more a sensitivity, you have to go for the vitreous tap. Another uh, difficult issue is the treatment. Um, there are a lot of um, studies in the literature trying to say that one antibiotic is better than the other when you have to treat, how you treat the patient with uh, toxo. Uh, the Brazilian EVAT society, they um, say that you have to treat the macular and optner lesions uh, with Tignaf vitreous haze, a decreasing visual acute more than three lines and large area of retinitis. I usually treat all my patients with active uh, toxoplasmosis retinochoriditis independently where on the size of the disease or the visual acuity. Um, prophylaxis is another important issue. You cover this later on. So the treatment, usually they use the what's called the classic um, treatment, the pyramid mainly sulfadiazine, uh, but there's a lot of alternative treatments, uh, the Bactrin, Clindamycin with pyrimetamine and sulfadiazine, pyrimetamine and nazitromycin, nazitromycin alone, intravitreous clindamycin, and several studies were done and no one showed any difference between uh, these um, treatments. Oral steroids, I usually use my, uh, uh, do my treatment with oral steroids because I want to clear the vitreous and, and uh, try to control very quickly the inflammation to avoid a complication like uh, epiretinal membrane, uh, vitreous detachment, macro hole. I will show you uh, the number of complications we have in, 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 in toxoplasmosis retinochoriditis, but there's no clinical trying showing the benefit of uh, steroids as a digivent therapy for ocular toxoplasmosis. In a survey did in Brazil, uh, apart from the society, say that you only have to treat large areas, the visual acute, the, the lesion close to the macula and the disc. Uh, the specialists in UVIs in Brazil, almost 70% treat all cases. Uh, and interestingly, uh, you don't see any difference between uh, the, the therapies, sulfadiazine, pyrimetamine, or Bactrin or clindamycin, but the majority of uh, specialists prefer to use the classic a treatment in patients that present with central lesions or diminished pressure or acquired uh, atypical forms. So it's, it's, it's difficult to say that's really no difference. Um, there's no difference between uh, uh, the, the therapy in, in published in the literature, but in practice, they use more the classic uh, treatment when we have more uh, Site-threatening lesions. Uh, it's important also to say that the risk uh, of side effects is quite high, and we did a, a study with uh, more than 200 cases in, in Brazil, and we have 85 uh, percent present with some um, side effects to the treatment of. Uh, Toxoplasmosis retinochoriditis, most of them uh, related to steroids, but it's important to remember that sulfa and pyrimetamine can uh, lead to uh, some systemic side effects. Uh, the prophylaxis is something that we are using more regularly since Felix and, and colleagues published this study in the American Journal. Uh, showing that the prophylaxis with Bactrin uh, reduces the relapses uh, after three years. And then uh, Felix followed these groups uh, to six years and published uh, the same results. So we, we are doing prophylaxis for patients that relapses a lot. So we, one patient, for example, that you treat with uh, specific treatment and just after one month or two and relapses. So we, we present this possibility for prophylaxis. We do a Bactrin every other day for a year or in patient that's only eye or a lesion very close to the, the center of fovea. So 
we 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 say that there there's a possibility to avoid uh, pro, uh, relapses. This is not guaranteed that we we'll, uh, uh, work, but uh, there's some data that's a benefit to doing uh, a prophylaxis. Remember, there's a long term doing back trend. There's a lot of uh, uh, side effects, so we have to discuss with the patient uh, the pros and cons to do the prophylaxis. Um, another important issue that's a lot of people based on one paper published a long time ago, I uh, started to do uh, prophylaxis uh, prior to intraocular procedures. So we decided uh, with Dr. Pavezo to do a, a retrospective study uh, in our patients uh, who underwent uh, ocular surgery and we saw no relapses in 65 patients, only four patients relapsed after three to 17 months, showing that there's no relation between the surgery and the toxoplasmosis relapse. So we decide not to use prophylaxis anymore. And if you think of the number of cataract surgery and the number of patients with a scar in the back, we don't see much uh, relapses in ocular toxoplasmosis following intraocular surgery. And there's a lot of complications you do see in toxo, vascular occlusion, neovascular membranes, retinal detachment, macro hole, upper retinal membranes and visual field defects. And that's why in the majority of patients we do use steroids to try to avoid uh, vitreous or improve the vitreous inflammation. Uh, in two, 230 patients we're in the National Institute of Infectious Disease in Brazil, we had 33, almost one, one third of the patients present with ocular complications. And the most common, the residual visual vitreous opacity. And the majority of these patients uh, needs a vitrectomy to clear uh, the vitreous. Epiretinal membrane is quite common too. Retina detachment and macro row, these are more uh, uncommon complications. So some uh, examples of uh, vascular occlusion and, and neovascular membrane and visual field defects. This, this patient was very unlucky to have this lesion just very close to the disc and causing this uh, visual defect and a macular hole with this uh, vitreous stretion and led to uh, this macular hole. You can see here, the lesion is not that close to the fovea, but because of the vitreous, uh, the vision dropped a lot. So thank you very much for invitation. I hope I cover a uh, few things about toxoplasmosis. Thank you, Dr. Andre. Uh, I think that was a wonderful presentation covering all aspects of ocular toxoplasmosis. Uh, for the benefit of uh, the uh, listeners, I just wanted to ask you, uh, typically, what is your protocol when you're giving oral steroids with the antibiotics? Do you start uh, the steroids simultaneously or do you give a gap and then start the steroids? I start in the same, in the same day. Uh, differently from viral that I, I, I wait for 48 hours uh, in Toxo, I can do in the same day. I usually use the classic therapy, but sometimes when I have the peripheral lesions, small lesions, I can go for back train. So it's my regular approach, doing the steroid the same day. Dr. Carlos? I agree. I, I use the same time. I think if you look at the books, they talk about three days loading those before you start. This is the concept that assumed that the toxoplasma would get worse if you started without cover, but that's not true. It's uh, we we all use it in concurrently. I, I think as as uh, uh, Andrea was saying, that I think my in my mind the main objective of treating a, a, an active toxoplasmic retinitis is controlled inflammation. Uh, it, this is what's going to cause all the collateral damage that you see in the eye. So if you shut down the information, you're improving the chance of reducing the complications that he listed there. Um, so I think you need to sterilize early on, but you can't give the steroids without cover. That's the, op it's the other way around. So I'm using the antibiotics because I'm giving the steroids. There's no evidence that the antibiotics alone without steroids change the course of the event. Thank you. 
So the event will run the same course with or without uh, antibiotics. The steroid is what makes the difference in terms of improving the outcome, but steroids cannot be given in isolation. So I agree. The, the, the point that Andre made as well, which is important, is that his view that he treats everybody. I'm, I'm on the other group. I don't treat everybody. I treat the patients with a, a more visually threatening problem or 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 vitritis. And, and uh, I think this is a debatable point. It, it's a uh, uh, different uh, ways of thinking. I don't think anyone is right or wrong. Uh, but he's quite clear about that. There are two groups and, and the thinking is a bit different. So I, I'm on the group of treating only, uh, not all cases, but, but the ones that I feel deserve more intervention. But I think it's, it's a, uh, I don't have a strong feeling about that. Yeah, I, 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 I treat all patients based on two, two thoughts. One is the opportunity that I have to kill the parasite. So theoretically, I will have more, uh, less parasites in the retina to recover. And the other point is if you have a, one lesion in the periphery, I don't know how this lesion will behave in a week. And I want to give them steroids to try to avoid traction in the periphery. So I cover with antibiotics. So I give you Bactrin, there's less, have less problem with the side effects. And give you them steroid. That's my my point. I, I agree with people that don't treat all, but more and more I'm doing I'm doing this. Yeah, but when do you, when do you use intravitreal clindamycin in case of toxoplasmosis? Yeah. So yeah, we, sorry, yeah, we, I, yeah. Please go ahead, Doctor Carlos. No, no. It's just just quickly. I I think we have been using that in patients who are you know don't tolerate because the, the issue of the injection is certainly. Uh, you, you need to treat and the duration of the treatment will vary on, on the behavior of the toxins. So some patients will need three injections, some average is about three, but some patients need five injections. It depends on, on how many weeks your treatment is going to go for. So it's the practicality of delivering injections sometimes is what stops you doing more of that. But there are patients like pregnant women or patients who have intolerance to the systemic therapy. So in these individuals, the combination of a, a, a clindamycin and dexamethasone uh, into the features uh, has equal results according to some studies that have been published. Arevalo published a few studies on that, and it shows very well that they are equivalent. So I think it is a strategy that can be used, and, and of course, uh, if you choose correctly your patient, then you you yes, it's an option definitely. Thank you, Andre. Anything from your side? Sorry. Any any comments from your side? No, I agree with Carlos. I, I think in pregnant women, uh, I, I think it's a good idea because an issue how to treat because uh, the the drugs can be a problem for the fetus. So it's a good option to avoid uh, any problem with the fetus during treatment. That's why I put uh, it's a, a different disease when you have an active lesion in a pregnant woman. So you have to treat different. And so clindamycin and dexamethasone is a good option. And would that be a weekly injection? I, I think you should go for one and then keeping an eye on, on, on the patient and see if you need more. So I agree with Carlos again that we probably do a, a, a weekly a weekly basis, but you have to have a look in the eye and see how it's going on. And Dr. Carlos, you also repeat it every week till the lesion yeah, is... Yeah, I, I think if, if I am uh, concerned about the size of the lesion, the activity, yes, I will use weekly. But if it's a small lesion that's responding well, you may not need to do that. That's why I said the average is about three injections, let's say average, because it could be less, it could be more. Uh, but in some patients, I have had to inject longer because uh, the disease was taking longer to resolve. The one important message for everybody listening is do never use... Uh, depot steroids in the eye of this patient. So if you only use any steroid, it's dexamethasone because it has a short life. It will be cleared out, has an anti-inflammatory effect. But if you put a, 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 a triamcinolone injection into these eyes, you're going to find it's going to be a problem. So do not use depot. Don't put Osrodex in these eyes. You just treat the acute event with your dexamethasone combined with clindamycin, and, and that's it. So don't, don't try. I've seen disasters associated with uh, triamcinolone injections into these eyes. I think that's a very important point. Uh, we'll move on to the next talk, and I invite now Dr. Padma Malini.
Very good evening to all of you. At the outset, I would like to thank AIOC and IUSG for giving me an opportunity to speak on infectious tuberculosis. Things a comprehensive ophthalmologist should know. Infectious uveitis is one of the most common and visually devastating causes of uveitis. The importance of early identification and treatment of infectious uveitis is important. The outline of my presentation, I will be covering about different causes of infectious uveitis, viral, toxoplasmosis, tuberculosis, syphilis, endogenous endophthalmitis, ducin, COVID-19 infection. Infective uveitis can be divided into viral, bacterial, fungal, parasitic, or helminthic causes. Among the viral uveitis, the hepatic group is the commonest one, which can be caused by herpes simplex virus 1 and 2, VZV or CMV, or RNA viruses like rubella, dengue, chikungunya also can cause. Recently, in the list, SARS-CoV-2 has been added following the pandemic. Viral anterior uveitis, we have a separate talk, so I will not get into the details. We diagnose based on the characteristic clinical feature that is diffuse pigmented keratic precipitates or atrophic patches on the iris. This gives us a clue the possibility of a viral etiology. In CMV, we can have central or coin-shaped keratic precipitates. Coming to the posterior viral uveitis, necrotizing viral retinitis is an ophthalmic emergency. Based on the morphology, we can diagnose and start the patient on empirical antiviral therapy without any delay. Acute retinal necrosis affects in the immunocompetent. Retinal periphery is predominantly affected. This is Swiss cheese pattern, what classically described. This next progressive outer retinal necrosis, it occurs in immunodeficient individuals. It's a nightmare for the treating ophthalmologist. Here you could see the Necrotizing retinitis can be bilateral without much vitritis. Immunodeficient individuals, in spite of therapy, the disease can progress. This is called crack mat appearance. The next comes in immunodeficient individuals where we have <clears throat> retinitis with retinal hemorrhages, classically described as pizza by appearance in the case of a CMB retinitis. So when we see such patients, we make the diagnosis based on the clinical presentations and we have to put them on antiviral therapy. Management could be depending upon the structures involved, could be systemic, it could be <clears throat> um, topical or intravitreal. If the patient is immunodeficient, we also start them on heart therapy. And if the patient of associated retinal detachment, then the surgical management comes into the play after appropriate antiviral therapy. Disease like for the benefit of the ophthalmologist. These are the pharmacological drugs, the route and the dosage used in case of viral retinitis. In a case of acute retinal necrosis, in addition to the intravenous, what we used to use earlier, oral val circular, um, oral val acevir is found to be effective. And also in a case of a CMV retinitis, induction and maintenance therapy is there, which can be given by either the intravenous or oral route. These are the various drugs used in the case of necrotizing viral retinitis. Whenever we see a patient's herpes zoster ophthalmicus in a young individual, or if the patient has multiple dermatomal distribution, multiple cotton wool spots in the fundus, the tomato ketchup or pizza pie appearance in a case of a CMV retinitis, or Oculus commercial carcinoma in a young individual. These are the thing, clinical clues we have to suspect HIV infection. In our practice, when we see this, we need to look out for HIV infection. The next toxoplasmosis, Dr. Andreas covered, so I will not get into the details. We make the diagnosis based on the clinical presentations. Whenever we have a light in the fog appearance, or reactivation of retinitis adjacent to the scar, where the serology and PCR can help us to confirm the diagnosis and we trot the patients on antitoxo with systemic steroids. So these are the various drugs which has been already described. So we will move on to the next entity, the mycobacterial uveitis. 
could be caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis or mycobacterium leprae or atypical mycobacteria. Whenever we see a patient with granulomatous uveitis, which is characterized by the presence of mutton fat keratic precipitates, Busaka sarcopis nodules, or broad-based posterior synechae, suggestive of a granulomatous inflammation, we need to rule out tuberculosis. Coming to the posterior segment, if the patient has serpiginous like choroiditis or choroidal granuloma, subretinal abscess, or nodular posterior scleritis, or retinal vasculitis, whenever we see a scar along the vessels, all this points towards the probability of tuberculous etiology, which we need to rule out in these cases. Tubercular retinal vasculitis occurs in young adults. Retinal phlebitis with peripheral retinal capillary closure. It's most often secondary to hypersensitive reaction to mycobacterial antigens. We treat these patients with ATT and systemic steroids. If the hemorrhage is severe, after the appropriate medical management, these patients receive anti-DGF or resistant, uh, persistent cases can undergo with your retinal procedures. How do we diagnose? Coming, Mantox test is important. The recommended dose is one TU unit. There are labs which do with five TU and 10 TU. We important, we need to specify the dose with one TU and we made it measure the areas of horizontal induration. HRCT is definitely a more sensitivity. HS6 day also can be used. Quantiferon TB gold test also can be used. If whenever we have a tissue, either in the form of lymph node, the biopsy can help us to differentiate from sarcoidosis. The molecular diagnostic methods such as MPB64 and IS6110 genomes help us to confirm ocular tuberculosis. Rupesh Akarpal at all. The team has developed COD STEAM, the COD calculator. It is available freely on online. If we put the clinical data, it gives us the guidance to whether to start anti TB or not. So I request the ophthalmologist to use this facility. It will give us a guidance to start the patient on anti TB drugs or not. Management important the ocular TB pulmonary. TB category where the treatment duration extends more than six months. Coming to the local therapy, which has been reported by Dr. Manisha Karwal et al. team, where they've used intravitreal moxifloxacin, an anti vgf agent, to show the good response in a case of a tuberculous granuloma. Whenever your patients with a TB, you started the patient on TB treatment, and steroids and there is worsening. Please don't stop the treatment. This could be a paradoxical worsening in some set of patients. In that situation, we need to continue ATT and steroids. Sometimes we may have to step up the dose of the steroids or may have additional immunosuppressive agents. Here is a case of a TB, serpiginous so like choroiditis with ATT. They will see a paradoxical worsening and healing lesions. Next, we'll move on to the next entity. A 50 year old man presented with watering in the eye where you could see the scleral lesion and also the whitish lesions extending into the anterior chamber of the eye with iris pearls. Systemic evaluation, he had classical features of leonin facies, um, facies, madarosis, and thickening of the ear lobe with nasal bridge. Skin biopsy confirmed it's a case of leprosy following treatment with anti-leprosy treatment and steroids, we could see the dissolving granulomatous lesions in the eye. Nowadays, the cases are less, but even if they're completely treated, when these patients come back for cataract surgery and other ocular procedures, the corneal sensation is decreased. We have to take extra precautions to prevent neurotrophic ulcers in these cases. The next comes spirochetal infection. It could be due to syphilis, limes, or leptospirosis. Here is a case of a 32-year male presented with decreased vision, counting finger half meter in the right eye and 618 in the left eye. On fundus examination, you could see the annular retinal opacification in the right eye. Left eye looks almost near normal with some amount of vitritis, but autofluorescence shows hyperautofluorescent lesions with a triangular patch of retinitis in the left eye. The triangular retinitis is one of the um, classical presentation of syphilitic retinitis which made us to suspect when we ordered the TPHC and VDRL both came positive, put the patient on anti-syphilitic treatment with IV crystalline penicillin for 14 days course 
following which we could see the complete resolution of an infections and inflammation in this case. It is important in fact to react this. When you pick up and put appropriate antimicrobial therapy, the results are rewarding. The syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease caused by Treponema pallidum. It's a great masquerade. With emergence of HIV infections, we are seeing more number of syphilis cases. Whenever we order, we have to order one non-treponemal, one treponemal test. And CTC recommends the ocular syphilis to be managed as a neurosyphilis. It is important that not only the person and also the partner has to be screened and treated, otherwise they come back with recurrence of infection. Next, we'll move on to endophthalmitis. Basically, an endogenous endophthalmitis could be bacterial, fungal, viral, or mixed. Um, here, uh, endogenous occurs in a chronically <clears throat> yeah, uh, ill patients like diabetes, chronic linear failure, immunocompromised with inveiling catheters. It could be due to endogenous or exogenous in a post-surgical. It could be post-operative or post-traumatic cases. In post-operative, can occur due to blepharitis, conjunctivitis, lacrimal tract obstruction, or operative risk factors like wound abnormalities, vitreous loss, prolonged surgery. It's important whenever we present with hypopion uveitis, we have to consider the possibility of endophthalmitis where we take the microbiological sample either by the anterior chamber tap or vitreous tap, depending upon the involvement and subject them for microbiological evaluation. And empirical antibiotic like vancomycin and septicidium along with systemic antibiotics help us to control the infection. Once we get the culture report, appropriate antimicrobial therapy can be planned if the inflammation is severe, parsprana vitrectomy plays a role in controlling the infection. So these are the various intravitreal antibiotics with the dosage commonly be used in a case of a bacterial endophthalmitis. Antifungal in a case of a fungal endophthalmitis. In viral retinitis, we use antiviral agents. The toxoplasma we have discussed about the intravitreal use of clindamycin. Here we see a 50-year-old male, known case of diabetes, a COVID positive, and he was treated with remdesivir and tocilizumab. He was investigated, presented like an intermediate uveitis like picture. Most of the investigations were within normal limits. He was started on systemic steroids by the primary ophthalmologist. Patient did not show improvement, then he was referred to us. On evaluation, we could see a pigmented keratic precipitates with prominent corneal nerves, multiple snowball opacities, which is significantly increased compared to the first presentation, along with vitreous opacities. Because of the COVID and immunotherapy and diabetic individual not responding to steroids, we did suspect the possibility of a fungal etiology. When we did the PCR, came positive for the panfungal genome and the culture revealed tropicalis, Canada tropicalis from the vitreous cavity. In addition to the intravitreal systemic antifungal therapy, the patient has to undergo pasplana vitrectomy, following which we could see the complete resolution of infraction in this case. In post-COVID, this was a challenge, especially following the second wave. Next, we'll move on to another infectious etiology, like cystisarcosis. Here is a case of subretinal cystisarcosis. It's a large cyst. The B scan shows subretinal cystisarcosis with retinal detachment. We need to do the neuroimaging to rule out neurocystisarcosis before we put the patients on treatment. And yet in the case of a fibrinous uveitis, following treatment with topical and systemic steroids, we could see the clear cyst. Following the vis visco expression, this diagnosed to have cystisarcosis, the child is doing well. Next entity is a diffuse unilateral subacute neuroretinitis or DUSEN. It's a multifocal chorioretinitis caused by the nematode. Severe unilateral loss of peripheral and central vision. Clustered yellow-gray white lesions. They have a subretinal tunnels. We call it as a Garcia sign, which is classically picked up on fundus virus and angiography. We manage this. as soon as we see the worm, the first thing we do is a photocoagulation followed by medical management. Here is a case of a duration where we could classically see the subretinal worm. These, this is the worm and these are the tracks. Following laser, there was a dead worm and subsequently managed with steroids and anti treatment. Next, we'll move on to post-viver retinitis. We see quite a few cases 
in our part of the country. Patient gives with history of fever, sometimes with skin rashes. They must have treated empirically as viral fever. Following two to four weeks later, the patient presents with decrease in vision. This morphologically, they have retinitis, retinal hemorrhages, macular star. This could be based in the serological or molecular diagnostic can help us to differentiate this entity. Could be due to chikungunya, dengue, rickettsial, or West Nile. Recently, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 virus has been added in the list. Here is a male presented with fever followed by multifocal retinitis with retinal hemorrhages. On evaluation, the Bill Felix test positive for the tick typhus. FFA showed early block fluorescence with late staining and leakage, treated the patients with doxycycline and steroids, following which we could see the resolution of retinitis in this case. This is one of our earlier cases where we have treated this case and reported as recurrent retinitis a case series. Next, we move on to COVID-19 and uveitis. It has varied presentations, could be anterior uveitis, panuveitis, macular, mm, mm, acute macular neuroretinopathy, various vascular occlusions, serpiginous psychoroditis, endogenous endophthalmitis, and SARS-CoV-2 retinitis. This is a schematic diagram showing various manifestations following COVID. There are reports where the SARS-CoV-2 has been isolated from the conjunctiva and also from the vitreous cavity. In severely immunosuppressed, they have extensive involvement like mucormycosis as well. 14 year of female presented with loss of vision. She had erythema multiformi like skin lesions. On this examination, you could see the retinitis, retinal hemorrhages with vascular occlusions. In addition to treating her with systemic steroids, we also put her on anticoagulant because of the increased D-dimer value, following which we could see the resolving retinitis in this case. COVID-19 and uveitis is important to differentiate what stage of the disease we are going to see this either infective, inflammatory, or secondary infection. If it's infective, we are going to treat the patients with antiviral therapy, inflammatory and hypercoagulable corticosteroids and anticoagulants. Secondary infections, we are going to treat with appropriate antimicrobial therapy. I would like to conclude with this case. A 38-year-old male presented with redness and pain. On examination, right eye was absolutely fine. The left eye had circumciliary congestion, an AC reaction with ipopion, with prominent corneal nerves. Pandas examination was normal. When we did the routine evaluation, he had increased pustules on urine microscopy. Urine culture revealed Klebsiella pneumonia growth, and the patient was put on appropriate antibiotic like ciprofloxacin, following which we could see complete resolution of an infraction's inflammation in this case. This is a simple UTI causing uveitis, hypopion uveitis. To conclude, your detailed history and thorough clinical examination still remain the most important diagnostic tool for uveitis evaluation, which is applicable to infective uveitis as well. We need to tailor make the list of investigations according to the clinical picture. So whenever you suspected a case of syphilis, we ordered only that test. If this patient had a UTI, only urine, microscopy, and culture and sensitivity. So it has to be tailor made according to the clinical presentation. Aggressive and appropriate antimicrobial therapy along with plus or minus systemic steroid therapy helps us to control the infections and also control the inflammation in this case. I would like to acknowledge our team members for the contribution. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Padma. I think you have covered the vast spectrum of infectious uveitic entities. And of course, we now have to be very much aware of the COVID-19, which is added to the viral infections. Uh, I have a quick question for you that when would you opt uh, for doing a AC tap and send it for a PCR analysis for viral infection, uh, even though on a clinical uh, examination, you are suspicious of a viral infection? When would you like to super add it by doing an AC tap and sending it for PCR? So whenever I suspect a CMV infection, either in the form of CMV anterior uveitis, or uh, C, um, CMV posterior um, CMV retinitis, especially if the patient is immunocompromised with multiple comorbidities where starting the GAN cycle over is not a feasible option because of the renal involvement. In those situations, I will ask for ACTAP for PCR for viral genome. Now, um, 
and also in necrotizing retinitis, also we can do to find out the exact etiology. First, we can start the empirical therapy and also the affordability, accessibility help us to confirm the exact diagnosis. As far as the DNA viruses are concerned, coming to the RNA, we wanted to know whether it's due to chikungunya or dengue or SARS-CoV-2. Especially these kind, if the facilities are available, we can do the AC tap and confirm the exact etiology is we see the patient in an infective stage. And also the rubella can have like, you know, some of the fluke like fixture and chronic uveitis, the rubella also helpful to diagnose in the case of an RT-PCR for rubella virus. These are the common things we, clinically we do. Of late, the Epstein-Barr virus PCR is also helpful to diagnose. And Dr. Andre, what about you at in Brazil? Uh, do you really uh, give a weightage to a lab investigation uh, reporting a viral infection or the treatment is entirely based on your clinical judgment? Uh, it's quite difficult to have the PCR study in Brazil for uh, uh, intraocular materials. So we go for based on clinical picture most of the time and uh, leaving only the really difficult cases to do a AC tap of vitreous uh, biopsy. Uh, unfortunately, I, I agree with Dr. Uh, Mahandradas that these cases with, will be the, the best ones to, to have the AC tap. Uh, the sensitive for herpes virus is very good. So it's uh, a confirmatory uh, um, diagnosis would be better if you could do. And for how long would you recommend uh, continuing the antiviral therapy? What would be your recommendation uh, for continuing the antiviral therapy so that there is no recurrence of infection? Padma, what is your routine uh, protocol? Basically, whenever we see acute retinal necrosis, we start the patient on Cyclovir. Now we go for oral valacyclovir therapy and uh, uh, basically one or sometimes we go up to 1.5 gram three times a day. Um, basically, in addition to seeing the clinical response to the healing pattern, we put them on long-term therapy at least 12 to 14 weeks in a case of an acute ARN. So that to prevent the occurrence of retinal necrosis in the other eye. In addition to that, if the patient have associated systemic comorbidities like herpes encephalitis or other problem, then we do put them on maintenance therapy for longer duration of time for many months. That is for as far as ARN is concerned. Coming to the PORN, the response to antiviral therapy itself is very poor and land up with retinal necrosis and complications. And also we have to combine with the heart therapy and we closely need to monitor the drug toxicity in these cases. Coming to CMV retinitis, we put them on induction followed by maintenance therapy. The clinical healing pattern we monitor and then I titrate the treatment as per the clinical presentation is concerned. Ideally, it can be titrated with RT-PCR, but it's not possible to do in all cases and it's not practically feasible to do it. As far as these three things, coming to the CMV anterior uveitis, uh, there again, um, based on the clinical response to treatment. In addition to the clinical picture, I also use confocal microscopy to monitor the infective pattern changing from infective to non-infective or disappearance of the keratic precipitates to titrate the treatment. So Dr. But Andre, after you had a complete healing of the lesions that you're seeing inside the eye, after that, for how long would you continue with the antiviral therapy? Uh, uh, Usually, usually for, for 12 weeks. Uh, I, I, I usually manage my, my patient a little bit different. I use uh, intravenous acyclovir. And if I can see the, the, the healing uh, lesion, I will start uh, 48 hours after that, the steroids. I don't like to use um, valacyclovir for acute retinal necrosis. Uh, even though there's a lot of studies showing good results with this medication. So I prefer to put on, on uh, the hospital and did uh, intravenous therapy. Uh, about CMV retinitis, I, I usually go for intravenous gancyclovir and then the maintenance therapy until the CD4 counts go uh, over 150. 
So I stopped the, the manthanin therapy. Uh, we don't have uh, a Valgan cyclovir in Brazil. It's very, very expensive. Would be the best option to give orally uh, treatment for CMV retinitis. But still now we have to do for intravenous for 21 days. Right. So I'll just take up now the last talk of uh, today's session. And uh, we can't have a uveitis session without talking about steroids. I think uh, they play an extremely important role. So I'll just uh, take up this topic of how to use steroids smartly in a patient of uveitis. So uh, no one is really allowed to die or go blind without a trial of steroids. And I think it is a very valid saying when we are dealing with patients of uveitis that we cannot declare the patient as non-responsive till we have not tried corticosteroids. So once you have ruled out infection or malignancy, ocular inflammation is the principal cause of complications in most of the patients. And the control of inflammation is very much the primary goal of managing any patient of uveitis. And it apparently is like a firefighting to control the ocular inflammation as early as possible. The other goals, of course, being of the treatment is to have an early control of inflammation, but with minimal side effects, to prevent a permanent damage to the ocular structures, and also to prevent long-term visual loss in our patients. There can be various modalities of giving corticosteroid therapy, one of course being the systemic steroid therapy, the second being a local steroid therapy, which can be given in the form of posterior subti non transdermal injections, uh, intravitreal implant of dexamethasone, which is commonly known as Ozodex. We do also have other implants in the form of flucinolone acetonoid implant, which comes in the trade name of Retisert. And flucinolone acetonoid implant, again, is, uh, which is known as Illuvian. Now, recently, people have also started treating uveitis patients with a supracoroidal transcellon depot injection. So coming to systemic therapy with corticosteroids in uveitis, we do have an induction phase and a suppression phase where the induction phase mainly is the initial phase of control of active inflammation. And it is very much applicable to all the cases of inflammation. It has to be done as early as possible. And we do not have to give the corticosteroids in a lesser dosage. It is extremely important that when we are starting to treat a patient of uveitis, it has to be given in a full dosage. As far as the maintenance of control of inflammation is concerned in chronic inflammatory diseases, it has to be done after we have achieved a successful induction. For chronic severe diseases, long-term suppressive therapy is the key to a long-term success, and also we have to avoid any kind of a recurrence. Now, what are the indications of using systemic corticosteroids? So one would be a chronic bilateral disease where you want the effect to happen in both the eyes. And this is primarily when the uveitis is involving the posterior segment beyond the anterior segment involvement. When we are not getting any response to a local therapy, the eye diseases associated with systemic diseases, again, we would think of systemic steroids, and a severe inflammation that is too painful or is likely to cause a destruction of the ocular structures is the time we will opt for systemic corticosteroids. So typically we will start with an initial dose of one milligram per kg uh, per day. The maximum adult oral dose may go up to as high as 80 milligrams per day. And a maintenance dose is usually varying between 7.5 to 10 milligrams per day. As far as the tapering schedule is concerned, I don't think that it is a very mechanical process. And we apparently taper our corticosteroids depending upon the response that we see clinically when we are doing a follow-up of our patients. However, it's extremely important with systemic steroids that we monitor the patient for various systemic side effects, such as blood pressure, the weight gain, the glucose levels, which are very important. And the patients who are borderline diabetics or diabetics, they have to be very closely monitored. The lipid levels have to be monitored. The bone density has to be again monitored, especially within the first three months and then thereafter annually. 
We also have to give supplements such as calcium and vitamin D3 are usually given along with corticosteroids. As far as the oral corticosteroids in children are concerned, a short-term oral steroids are acceptable but not long-term because of the various side effects which can hamper the growth in the children. The early use of immunosuppression is indicated in children, so the acute phase of uveitis will be managed by giving oral corticosteroids, but a very quick shift over to immunosuppressant drugs, such as amethotrexate, is very much warranted while we are dealing with children with uveitis. Growth monitoring, again, is very crucial if we are contemplating a long-term therapy with steroids, and usually corticosteroid therapy has to be done along with the, uh, you know, in alliance with a pediatrician or a rheumatologist who can take care of the systemic side effects. Now, I'll just briefly touch upon this interesting case of a 61-year-old female patient who presented with pain and floaters in the left eye for last three days. The right eye had a vision of 6, 9, and 8, and there was a yellowish mass in the supranasal quadrant with exudative retinal detachment and a dilated conjunctival vessels over it. I'm sorry, she presented with pain and floaters not in the left eye, but in the right eye for last three days. And what we typically see is this yellowish mass lesion in the supranasal quadrant. And when we did the optical coherence tomography passing through the macular area, it did show the subretinal fluid suggestive of exudative retinal detachment. And you also had the undulations of the ocular layers. We did an ultrasound B scan and which was very much suggestive of exudative retinal detachment. However, there was also an element of a T sign, though it was not very distinctive. We did go ahead and do a fundus fluorescein angiography, which showed a hot disc suggestive of an inflammatory pathology. There was a lot of RPE alterations. And we did get a diffuse hyperfluorescence in the supranasal quadrant where we were seeing the yellowish discolored mass. The presumptive diagnosis made was of a nodular posterior scleritis with exudative retinal detachment. All the investigations were done and the patient was started on oral corticosteroids. At two weeks follow up, we find that there was a beautiful resolution of the exudative retinal detachment. The patient had recovered a vision of 6, 9, N6, and the patient was extremely asymptomatic, not having any pain, and was responding to the treatment very well. This is a 24-year-old female patient with diminution of vision in the left eye for last five days, already on treatment with antitubercular drugs for pulmonary tuberculosis. Her CECT was suggestive of fibr fibroparenchymal lesion in the left upper lobe and calcified lymph nodes bilaterally suggestive of an active TB infection. Her mantux was very strongly positive. Now, when you see the left eye fundus, you do see a large granuloma which is involving the supranasal quadrant. And you see these typical petechial hemorrhages, very clinical, very classical of a tubercular granuloma. You also see that there is an involvement of the optic nerve head, and you do have an optic nerve head granuloma. On OCT passing through the lesion, you do see the involvement of the overlying retinal layers, which again is very much suggestive of a TB granuloma. There was evidence of cystoid macular edema in the macular area. And we have done this study where we have treated the TB granulomas very successfully by giving intravitreal injections of Avastin and moxifloxacin. And we get a beautiful regression of the entire TB granuloma within a few weeks time. But subsequent to the regression of the entire TB granuloma, we saw an enlargement of this lesion on the temporal side, which initially was not present, suggestive of a paradoxical reaction. And here on this paradoxical reaction was then treated with intravenous methylprednisolone, and you see that the patient responded very well. Our study also evaluated the VEGFA levels in these patients and found that there were VEGF levels were extremely high in these patients of TB granuloma, mounting to as high as three times which are found in patients with AMD CNBM. So this is the timeline of this patient, starting with a vision of 636N12, responding to the intravitreal injections of moxifloxacin and avastin, and beautifully recovering a vision of 66N6. But what is important for us to know is that we need to recognize a paradoxical reaction 
which again responds to a very high dose of intravenous corticosteroids in this particular patient. Coming to local steroid therapy, the indications are non-infectious uveitis in adults, pediatric uveitis, a patient not responding to systemic therapy, and if we have contraindications to using systemic corticosteroids, such as pregnancy, diabetes, or any kind of a psychiatric illness. The side effects of local corticosteroid therapy, we very well know, can be an increase in intraocular pressure or a cataract formation, which can be rather devastating to a young patient uh, being given local therapy. So this is the 33-year-old male patient. He had a history of trauma with an iron particle eight days back, followed by diminution of vision, and he underwent a corneal tear repair elsewhere. The diminution of vision in the right eye was for last one day, and which was not the eye which had seeked the trauma. So the vision in the right eye had dropped to 612, while the vision in the left eye, which had got the trauma, was as low as hand movements. On a slit lamp examination, there was evidence of anterior chamber cells in the right eye, which was the sympathizing eye. And the left eye, you could see the corneal sutures were in place. There was evidence of posterior synechia formation and, of course, the traumatic cataract. The patient underwent an intraocular foreign body removal in the left eye. However, in the right eye for last one day, where he had a diminution of vision, on fundus fluorescein angiography, you see that there was evidence of the small punctate leakage, which was seen on fundus fluorescein angiography. So you can sometimes get this kind of a presentation, which we have reported, which is a little atypical presentation of sympathetic in ophthalmia, only involving the posterior segment. We did an OCT, which again was suggestive of a serous detachment. And this patient was treated with intravenous methylprednisolone for three days, followed by oral corticosteroids. And subsequently, he was treated with azothioprine, which was continued for literally a year. So this is how the patient responded. And in two months, he had gained a vision of 6-6-N6. And since this was the only seeing eye of the patient, he did extremely well, and we were able to salvage this uh, eye. Now, the only problem in this patient was, as you see, that at four weeks follow-up, the patient had recovered a vision of 612, but was still continuing to have a very, uh, you know, small pocket of subretinal fluid in the macular area. And this is the time when we decided to inject an Ozodex implant in this patient, along with continuation of systemic steroids and azathioprine. And again, the patient showed a beautiful response at two months with a vision recovery to 66N6 after the Ozodex implant. Now, moving on to my next patient, a 23-year-old boy with pain and redness in both the eyes for the last three to four months. There was a history of lymph node multidrug-resistant tuberculosis diagnosed 10 years back, and he had already taken a treatment for three years. And there was, however, no treatment record available, so we don't know what all drugs were given at that time. The patient had a vision of 66N6 in both the eyes. There was evidence of vitreous cells. He was started on tablet Visalon in tapering dose along with lotipred eye drops. We went ahead and did a fundus fluorescein angiography and also we did an OCT. Now this patient apparently showed both healed lesions and active lesions in the right eye, while in the left eye there was evidence of extensive healed choroditis patches. Now the problem was that despite being on all the treatment, that is ADT, corticosteroids, the patient continued to have these active lesions in the right eye. And they were approaching the macular area, threatening the vision of this patient. So at this time, we decided to give an Ozodex implant. You see the implant in the upper image. And you see that there was a beautiful regression of these active lesions in the right eye. Now, this is a pregnant female patient in her third trimester with a diminution of vision in the right eye for last one week. The vision was as low as 660 with a few vitreous cells. And when we did a fundus fluorescein angiography, the angiography was very much suggestive of a VKH in this disease. There was a typical pattern which was seen on OCT, which again confirmed the diagnosis. And since she was a pregnant female, we avoided uh, using the systemic corticosteroids in this patient. And that is why we opted for giving an intravitreal Ozodex injection. And you see that there was a beautiful response in this patient on giving an Ozodex injection. Now, since this patient was uh, in her third trimester, 
After she delivered, we started her on immunosuppressive therapy to avoid a recurrence of the disease. So there are certain principles to remember for smartly using the corticosteroids in uveitis patients. One is that we must assess what is the type of uveitis that we are dealing with. We must rule out infectious uh, underlying etiology and also that we may have any kind of a malignancy which may be masquerading as a cause of uveitis. And then it would be very disastrous to start these patients on, U on corticosteroids, which may actually mask the underlying etiology. The third principle would be to hit hard and hit fast. And this is the induction phase with full dose of corticosteroids to control the eye inflammation as early as possible. And this is basically to avoid an ocular structure damage. The maintenance therapy with steroids or immunosuppressants are very important for chronic uveitis patients to avoid long-term complications and also to avoid a recurrence of active inflammation. We have to use steroids judiciously with monitoring of the systemic side effects because we know that the systemic corticosteroids can have very severe systemic side effects. As far as the pediatric age group is concerned of uveitic patients, we have to have an early shift to immunosuppressants or we can opt for a local steroid therapy, but the systemic steroids have to be given for a very short duration to avoid a, a, you know, a damage to their growth pattern. We should consider the local therapy, and that is extremely important. Wherever the systemic uh, corticosteroids are contraindicated, such as diabetes or in pregnancy. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thanks a lot for the enlightening talk and nicely you covered most of the <coughs> uses and also the indications for the good case examples, Dr. Manisha. Now, I would like to ask if the patient is a steroid responder, and how would you like to modify your corticosteroid therapy in uveitic patients? So if I'm dealing with a patient who's in his induction phase where I feel that the steroids are going to be extremely important in getting a very the early control of inflammation, I probably will take the help of my glaucoma colleague to have a simultaneous control of the intraocular pressure and try to tide over that induction phase. However, if I feel that the inflammation is quite under control and we can take a, a call and stop the corticosteroids during that time, then probably I will do an early shift to an immunosuppressant if I know that the patient is a steroid responder. Let me ask one question, Dr. Manisha. Uh, how confident you are with the local therapy for infectious disease? You showed uh, a beautiful case of tuberculous uh, granuloma. So, how confident you manage with, for example, uh, cystoid macroedema and CMV retinitis? So, I would probably, uh, surely, as far as the TB granulomas are concerned or uh, TB choroiditis is concerned they will surely avoid a depot steroid in these patients. And not even I would not even opt for a dexamethasone or any kind of an intravitreal injection, except for when we are dealing with TB granuloma, where we have been constantly using anti-VEGF and moxifloxacin. However, in certain patients where the patients have been on ATT and on systemic corticosteroids, but still we find that we are having macular threatening lesions, like I showed one case example, those are the patients where we find that they respond very well to an Ozodex implant. And these are certain patients, we really don't know what's going on inside, because these are the patients who have been on ATT and on steroids for a very long term. Despite that, they are not showing a regression. Now, in that cases, probably it is not the infection which is, you know, making the lesions, but it is more of an immunological response which is responsible for the expansion of the lesions. In those cases, surely I will opt for a intravitreal injection or give a depot steroid. As far as the CMV retinitis is concerned, I probably would not uh, give for any kind of uh, you know, steroid injections inside the eye. And I would surely opt for just a systemic therapy. Thanks. So I think we've all had a wonderful session today on uveitis and I hope that the listeners, they have benefited from all the wonderful talks that we have had. So thank you so much for joining. Andre, thank you. Padma, thank you so yeah. much. And uh, we look forward to one more enlightening session on uveitis 
in the near future. Thank you so much. Very much. Thank you. Bye Thank bye. you. Bye-bye.